Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you are just coming in, please feel free to tell us where you are zooming in from today. Uh, I am still zooming in from West Hills in my home. The library is still not open to the public, but we are hoping in the shortcoming weeks or months that we'll be able to be broadcasting live from the library soon. My name is Rebecca Harding. I am the Associate Director of Learning and Engagement, and it is my honor and privilege to host Reagan EDU Chats, which is our small, short, 30-minute web series that we're doing about all things election um, and having critical conversations about things that are affecting our nation. So we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to jump right into it, and I'm going to introduce our wonderful <laughs> panelists that we have here with us today. First, we have Julie Silverbrook. Julie served as the executive director of the Constitutional Sources Project, Consource, in Washington, D.C. from 2012 until 2020. She regularly writes and lectures on the United States Constitution and its history and the importance of civic education to the health of the American Republic. She holds a JD from William and Mary Law School and a BA in political science from the George Washington University. And she is here representing iCivics today. Welcome, Julie. Hi. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> You're fine. It's always that Zoom lag. A very 2020 moment. We are also joined by Victoria Pasquatonio. Uh, she's the education producer of PBS NewsHour and runs NewsHour Extra, NewsHour's teacher source website for middle school and high school students. Extra produces current event resources on civics, STEM, arts, and media literacy based on the content of the NewsHour. Uh, she edits the news hours extras educator voice and student voice blogs and is always on the lookout for new writers so please don't hesitate to reach out to her. Uh, we will put her link in, or her email in the chat and before switching careers Victoria actually taught middle school and high school social studies and English for 13 years and we are so pleased to have her with us, thank you. So glad to be here. Well, welcome, ladies. I am very excited to have these two civic powerhouses together in this conversation. Today, we're going to be talking about bringing the election into the classroom. Um, but before then, we're going to kind of show a little bit of our personalities by our coffee mugs. This web series is more like conversations over coffee. So I'm doing a repeat of my political listen, engage vote since we're talking about the elections. But Julie, why don't you tell us a little bit about your mug? Oh, you're on mute. I cannot believe I did that twice. That's embarrassing for me. It says like a boss, which is not how I'm handling Twitter right now. Um, it, just because I'm feeling a little bit saucy, this sits on my desk uh, and I will either be filled with a caffeinated beverage or I'll put some, you know, pens or something in there. Um, and it's just for me, it's just a good reminder to handle life like a like a boss, right? Like a person who feels empowered. So it's my favorite one. Great. And Vicki, what about your mug today? Here, I like that. I'll cheers to that. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is my, I'm told, could be worth something one day. Margaritaville Hollywood, which uh, Jimmy Buffett's <laughs> Margaritaville doesn't actually exist anymore in Hollywood. And so this was super sale in their, in their store. And I was told by the clerk behind the counter, hey, you could be worth some money one day because we're not going to be here in, in another month or two. But that's uh, I thought it had some historic um, um, importance to, as a result of that. So anyways, cheers, everyone. So glad to be here. Cheers. <laughs> All right. So we don't have a lot of time, so we're just going to get right into it. Um, so talking about bringing the elections into our classroom, I think we kind of need to zoom back a little bit first and really just kind of talk about what's going on in the state of our nation. You know, a colleague recently framed our situation as that we're living through multiple pandemics or crises. Um, yeah, obviously there's COVID-19 that's affecting our mobility, our health, our economy, but there's also, you know, the shared crisis of what's happening politically in our nation, um, the health of our democracy. So Julie, as our go-to constitutional scholar, I was hoping that you might be able to frame kind of where we're at today for teachers. Yeah, so we're certainly living through a unique and uniquely stressful moment in our nation's history. Uh, we're living through a global pandemic um, that's forced most of us uh, into our homes uh, to be socially isolated from each other. 
Um, I actually think the pandemic is a twin crisis in, a, in and of itself in the sense that there's a physical health crisis um, and then there's a mental health crisis that's impacting all of us to some extent. Um, we have uh, economic strains, right? Rising uh, unemployment. Um, we have uh, people who are out of work. Uh, we have strain on working parents uh, who are working from home while their kids are out of school. Um, we have this crisis with distance learning, right? Uh, kids who are either partly uh, in person in school uh, or fully virtual. Um, we have no idea what the long-term effects that is going to uh, be uh, in terms of the impact on this generation of kids. Is it going to exacerbate um, existing learning gaps um, or is it going to further set kids behind? What's the consequence in terms of social and emotional learning and health for kids? Um, and then we have political polarization, um, which isn't necessarily new, right? Political polarization goes all the way back uh, to uh, the early days of the American uh, Republic. Um, I always, to just to put things in perspective, uh, because today uh, media reaches into our homes, literally through our various devices, it can sometimes feel like, I uh, think this is a, this is a more, uh, more polarized, and in some ways it is, but a more polarized, a nastier election uh, than the elect uh, elections of yore. Um, and I always say, you know, if you look back to the election of 1800, where they were burning John Adams and Thomas Jefferson in effigy, um, things were quite polarized back then and also quite personal uh, in terms of um, they weren't attack ads as such, but um, there would be these broadsides written that would attack the character of Thomas Jefferson and uh, talk about, um, you know, his relationship with uh, Sally Hemings, who was an enslaved uh, person. Um, he was a slave owner. That was something that was discussed. Uh, John Adams' body type, um, he was quite pear-shaped. Uh, that was discussed uh, in elections. And there's a, there's a long history um, of that. I'm not saying that it's admirable, it's certainly not, um, but I think it's good to put things into uh, perspective. Along the same lines as that, there's all of these crises and it feels incredibly overwhelming um, and people are very stressed and anxious, but we're also seeing the, this, uh, these amazing opportunities for engagement and for unity. I look at, um, you know, in the early days of the COVID crisis, when there weren't enough masks for frontline healthcare workers um, and other first responders, people doing what happened in the American Revolution, right? Like they were making their own masks. It was like homespun during the American Revolution. There's such a long history of that too. Um, kids, uh, families getting together to make masks, uh, donating to, to charities, donating meals to uh, first responders and healthcare workers. Um, now you're seeing this with the election, right? A, a higher level of engagement. Uh, we have early voting. Um, if you look at uh, voter turnout for early voting, we're at historic highs. Um, I just saw a poll before we logged in um, that 92% of voters in battleground states are more energized than ever to vote in this election. That's kind of exciting in a way, right? So there's opportunities that come with challenges. And I am... I just forever going to be an optimist. The glass is always half full uh, from my perspective. And even though things are really hard and there's a lot of work to do to really rebuild the civic fabric of this country, there's an amazing opportunity coming out of this kind of knockdown, drag out fight um, in the 2020 election where we can continue to learn and give opportunities for uh, young people, especially to, to get engaged and feel inspired. So I like to feel inspired uh, in moments of crisis. Um, it's a good psychological framing as well to, to get through is what are the opportunities that are coming out of um, this moment? And actually, if you look at human history, it's often been um, after a big crisis that you've seen huge strides in human innovation, uh, both in, in uh, government and in science and in technology. I think that's a really good segue in kind of talking about, 
you know, how this translates to in the classroom. Um, interestingly, I came across an article, it was written in October 2nd, I think it was right after the first presidential debate that was titled, is the election still a teachable moment? Um, and, uh, you know, just given kind of the, the negative trends that we're seeing because of the media and, and how pervasive it is in our lives um, with the election, you know, I, I would love to kind of talk just a little bit about one, what are the challenges that we're seeing for teachers to teach the election? Uh, and then two, maybe what are some of the opportunities? So when we start with the challenges, uh, Vicki, what are the challenges that classroom teachers are facing right now? I think it's a good question. I think the same as, as four years ago um, in terms of fear, sometimes the fear is a, a little more in the mind, um, but I hear that a lot from teachers, fear of pushback from parents um, because we've become more polarized um, from school administrators, um, not censoring, but sort of encouraging more carefulness and thought. And I think some educators sort of interpret that as, as sort of um, more of a warning than it might be. I think that uh, then there's, and there's sort of, there's the self-censorship that can happen. Um, but in some cases it's very real, the stories. And that, that continues to be the main, the main challenge that I'm hearing. And that was also from four years ago. Uh, I still think that social studies teachers are doing what they're doing and teaching the presidential election. I, I can't, I haven't heard the story of really complete stoppage or anything that dramatic that coming, coming our way. Yeah, Julie, so, anything to add? Yeah, it's such a great article because uh, we have such an active, and I know uh, Victoria does as well, like we have such an active social media uh, followers who are teachers talking about like, oh my goodness, I assigned the presidential uh, debate and it was just, you know, not civil in, in any way and not good modeling of behavior. And I don't think that there's uh, a person who watched that who thought, gosh, what a great exercise in civility. Although I will say, generally speaking, um, you know, a, a debate format isn't necessarily designed in to, to be a civil exercise. Um, but when that happened, I thought, well, you know what, there is a lesson, there is a takeaway that's really important for civic teachers to talk about. And that's talking about the importance of civility. How can you disagree in a way that's not disagreeable. And I would challenge students, how could you do it better, right? And what, it, what an amazing opportunity for students is how could you talk about these issues in a civil way where you're actually talking about the issues? Um, so from my perspective, again, it's a challenge, but how do you flip that challenge on its head and make it an opportunity? And that's something that I think civics teachers do all the time. They do it really, really well, um, you know, they, always flip things on their heads to get kids to be excited about something. So yes, I'm sorry that you watched that debate. I'm sorry for all of the millions of people who watched um, that debate because I do think it was sort of minimally useful, um, especially for people who are still undecided. So I think that's a relatively small uh, percentage of the population for this election. Um, but this is an opportunity to open up space for kids to do it right, right? To use their own voice. Um, and to talk about that. And we talk about civility and civic discourse all the time and the consequences of the breakdown. What a powerful illustration uh, that debate was of you know, one of the pathologies we talk about in the body politic. Yeah, I will, this wasn't planned in any form or fashion, but I will put a plug. We actually run a debate competition that's modeled off of presidential debate styles. And I've had to change the way I introduce it in most recent years because of the way in which the debates have gone. So I call it the OG debate style, like throwback uh, to the days of yore where they did talk about ideas. And even though they clashed, it was done in a way that wasn't disrespectful. And I feel like that that really came through um, in 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 the last debate. So check out the great communicator debate series. We would love to have you debate with us next year. Oh, right. uh, <laughs> I love so, it. <laughs> <laughs> quick plug. Um, but, you know, thinking about that, we and we know as civic practitioners how important it is to talk about the elections um, with students, but just come kind of from your own perspectives, why is it so important that educators K through 12, not just social studies teachers, um, are, are open to discussing um, elections in their classroom? Julie, we'll start with you. 
Yeah, look, I mean, I, elections are what determine the future course of the country. Um, I'll say we there is a, um, you know, perhaps reasonable but disproportionate amount of attention, uh, attention given to the presidency um, and that election, but there are elections taking place uh, all up and down uh, the ballot down to your local uh, government. And I do think uh, COVID has really uh, helped refocus on how important state, uh, local county government is. Um, you know, we've seen an increase in interest in a game we ha have called Counties Work, uh, which talks about uh, county level government. Um, and so I think from my perspective, you know, this elections are always important, um, not just every four years, elections actually happen more frequently than that. Um, and, you know, but every four years we really pay attention. Um, and this is what determines what happens in your communities, right? And it also this election is really being uh, painted out as a choice about who we are as Americans. And I, I think that is, um, you know, to some extent always the case in an election. Uh, but this it feels like a higher stakes election to people. Who are we as Americans? And you're going to make that choice, right? And let your voice be heard. There's so much going on. And, you know, one thing that we didn't talk about at the intro, and I would be remiss if I didn't, is, um, you know, after the killing of George Floyd, there have been uh, massive protests uh, all over um, the United States uh, protesting uh, racial injustice um, and inequality. Um, and I think that that's a really important dynamic uh, for this election um, as well. So uh, elections matter, they've always mattered. There's something about 2020, the fact that we're all inside and paying attention, <laughs> right? Where we feel like there, this is really high stakes. This is literally life and death. Um, you have. Uh, two candidates who have very different um, perspectives in terms of how to handle all of these crises, um, make that decision, right? Uh, that's an important part of us moving forward uh, as a nation. So um, just vote if you can. If you can't vote, we have a great resource uh, called our, uh, that was developed for uh, students by students called our Student Powers Election uh, Guide, which I definitely suggest uh, for students to check out because a lot of the folks that we talk to are uh, under the age of 18. They can't vote. What can they do? Um, there are plenty of opportunities for young people uh, to participate even outside of voting. Voting, as we like to say, is the floor for civic participation. It's the very base level um, of what you should do. Uh, there is so much more I, and you can do so many things that are really uh, robust, deep and interesting in terms of civic engagement, both within an election cycle and outside of an election cycle. Yeah, I think that's such an interesting point. Uh, when I when I work with uh, college students, I, I that's the question I asked to gauge the room in civic engagement. I said, how often do we hold elections? And 90% of the time they go, oh, every four years. I was like, incorrect. <laughs> every, year. every year, there's probably an election going on somewhere close related to you. Vicki, how about you? What, what really stands on the importance of teaching elections in the classroom right now? I think just um, historical precedence and, and context. We have um, one lesson on uh, to vote or not to vote. And the older African-American woman in the lesson is uh, talking about when she experienced discrimination and couldn't vote, full taxes and, and literacy ta um, tests and everything. And uh, it's really powerful. It's a really, she's, she's featured in the video and, and there's some questions to go along with it. So to sort of like anything in life, anything you might take for granted, um, when you hear stories like that, she's alive now. Um, it, it makes, I think kids feel grateful um, or, or young, you know, young adults. I think that um, another thing that uh, Julie was saying was this idea of uh, other important elections going on. You were referencing it to Rebecca. There's either, I think it was 11 or 15, something in that realm, um, states that now have um, young people, actually teenagers, not of voting age on their state school boards. Um, and I just think this is this is the coolest thing. Now they can't vote because they can't vote, I guess, in 
real life either. So they're non-voting members, but they go to all the meetings and they um, have a lack, they, 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 I don't know if they get appointed in some places. I think they might by either the governor or the head up head, head there of the uh, elect of the um, school board. But it's it's amazing, and it's really it's 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 high high sort of stress and stake high stake stuff. Um, and so I think those other types of elections down the ballot, um, voter initiatives are 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 important. I, just, yeah, I can't yeah. help but use props, so sorry, but I just want to say another thing to think about is these are this is the women's centennial stamps that the U.S. Post Office um, <laughs> This year is the 100th anniversary um, of the 19th Amendment, uh, the enfranchisement of women, and I just think, um, you know, the, the confluence of that uh, that historical milestone, a high stakes election. It's also a decennial census year. Um, and so I, I always plug this, um, the census, whenever that happens, should really help you refocus your attention on state legislatures because that's who decides questions of redistricting, which is what happens um, after uh, the census. Um, we also have an open seat um, on uh, the US Supreme Court elections have consequences. Um, and so, uh, you know, it has consequences on multiple levels. So in terms of the importance of this election, there are so many things happening. There's historical milestones. Uh, literally every branch of government has something of consequence uh, happening um, and the election um, will have an impact uh, on that. Um, and so, you know, again, going back to, is this the most important election um, of our lifetime. I don't know what comes next, but for me, it feels that way. Well, what's interesting is uh, I know both of your organizations are connected with um, Circle, which is the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement. And, you know, they just did a recent study that showed that students are 40% more likely to be lifelong voters if they engage in civic education and practices prior to turning 18. Um, and we've alluded to some of the different ways in which students can do that. And iCivics Resources is a great place to start. So for teachers who are feeling uneasy about teaching about elections because of either partisanship or just because of hashtag 2020, um, where are the entry points where they can actually talk about elections in a way that feels safe to them? Yes. Yeah, so Oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Julie. No, no, you go ahead. I've spoken too much. You go ahead. <laughs> no, not at all. Are you kidding? It's it's. I think getting involved in organizations. I know you run a lot of. You run so many events. Um, Reagan Library, um, for so many different ages, young adults, teenagers. I know we talked about one teacher that we work with who always goes and visits your <laughs> your library every year, um, and so. I think I think some virtual so one I think virtual field trips are actually a great entry point to places like what is the presidential library anyways Obama's been working on his library you hear about the Kennedy library and you hear about Reagan library well what is it well there's organizations attached to all these places and it's a great way to to talk to folks on zoom if you're a teacher and um, you know your students this is this is a really wonderful time to reach people and have to talk with them that you might otherwise have a hard time getting in touch with because of their schedules. Well, now they're, they're at home. There's a lot of time for virtual um, reaching out. So one of the other, besides that, besides virtual, which could really start with, you know, an image, a tour, um, a little deeper is through media literacy. So by evaluating the, the news media and everyone loves evaluating slash critiquing <laughs> the news media. I mean, I, I'm in the news media and I, like, I enjoy doing it. But um, basically evaluating, critiquing, looking at news sources, who was interviewed, who wasn't, what is the headline, what other sources um, are featured, or how many, you know, are there studies and facts and evidence included or is it more opinion? We have, um, uh, we just had, this is exciting, our student reporting labs, our youth journalists hosted an hour long program um, called, um, uh, actually the, it's right here in the chat, but this is a neat resource. Young fact checking experts show you how to tell fact from fiction online. And that's our student reporting labs. That has a bunch of videos about media literacy. 
and I'd highly suggest checking those out. Um, so it's a safe, I, I think it's a safe place to talk about really controversial issues because you're evaluating how the newsmaker, the journalist is telling the story. And now inadvertently or eventually you're gonna start to talk about the issue. But I think it's a great entry point into talking about the issue. And so um, lastly, we have a site that we just put up called journalisminaction.org. And we take a look at that crazy election of 1800 where yeah, whether you call them broadsides, I, I the, 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 you know, really huge, large broadsides, attack ads, um, but they, they, they were so vicious. So we have on this site um, primary sources featured from the election of 1800, um, as well as I'm so glad you brought up Julie suffrage, but women's suffrage. We have a whole case study on that. So those two, um, American Revolution and suffrage, we have how the news media has um, uh, written about these historic. Uh, events. And by evaluating the, the media, media literacy, I think it's a safe, um, safer and more comfortable way to talk about uh, tough topics. Yeah, so I, you know, it'd be remiss if I didn't plug our games, uh, but they also are popular and effective, and which is why they're so popular, you know, win the White House, cast your vote. Um, it It's really sort of process oriented, and it takes kids outside of the specifics of this election where the temperature is so high and really gets them to think about, this is how the process works. This is the consequences of voting. Um, but we also just released a video series uh, on teaching controversial topics. And I certainly would count the election as one. So we'd encourage folks to check um, that out. It's guidance from folks on our team and teachers in the field for how they teach controversial uh, topics. I know we're running out of time. I'll just give like a couple of, um, of the pointers that people give uh, for doing that. So thinking more along sort of Socratic seminars, uh, using breakout rooms, facilitated discussions, but really encouraging the kids and creating an environment where the kids feel safe um, expressing their views and sometimes flipping the script on them, take the opposite view uh, and argue that um, and, you know, really challenge uh, the kids to think in that way. It's a little bit different in the virtual setting. Um, I know one challenge that parents, or sorry, that teachers have talked about is that parents are oftentimes listening. Um, so I think the framing um, is really important, but I will also say something that we hear teachers talk about is just like the number of black squares they see on Zoom. So a lot of times kids aren't turning on uh, their cameras. And so when you flip the classroom and you're having the kids actively participate, I think that would encourage or you could require that they be um, on camera and interacting with each other. And I, that serves lots of purposes. I think it's a great learning experience, but it's also a, a moment to give the students and the teacher back that social interaction um, for it to feel more normal, uh, and more like a more normal learning um, environment. So I would just say don't shy away from teaching controversial issues. Go to iCivics. Uh, we have resources for you. There are other groups that have resources for teaching controversial topics. We think you should lean in on it. The importance is how you design that conversation um, and, you know, tips and tricks for designing a conversation in a virtual setting, which is a little bit um, different, but really just setting the pace for the students that this is a safe space for people to have views. We're not going to attack or ridicule anyone for having a particular viewpoint. Um, and again, flipping the script, having students who very clearly have a specific viewpoint argue the opposite side um, and come to appreciate the nuance on both sides, I think is just a really powerful uh, learning tool. Yeah, Julie, I love what you said in regards of that there are so many resources out there where we can have those those safe entry points. Um, you know, prior before coming into the civics world, I was really focusing on history and working in museums there. And, and when I joined the Reagan, I was um, taken aback by really how many organizations across the United States are actively working collectively together, not competing interests, but really working on these collaboratives to provide really rich and rigorous 
activities and resources for teachers. A couple of them that I will just name um, that I know all three of our organizations are a part of. So there's the Teaching for Democracy Alliance um, that's been headed up by Circle out of Tufts University. Um, great nonpartisan uh, resources about voting and elections and really rich in um, facts. Uh, studies that uh, can be brought into the classroom. Um, I know iCivics is, is heading up the, the Civics Now Collaborative. Um, and then there's also the um, Civics Renewal Network, where you know these organizations are coming together for a joint effort of wanting to ensure that civics education in K-12 and beyond um, is a stronghold, because uh, the strength of our democracy, I'll throw out a Reagan quote, we are never one generation away from losing our democracy. So it's important that we're bringing up the students who are behind the just now voters uh, so that they'll be ready to participate in 2024 and beyond. Um, this has been a phenomenal conversation. Every week I say it's not enough time. Um, so I just wanna say thank you so much to Julie and Victoria for being here and the wonderful organizations that you represent of iCivics and PBS NewsHour.